Our Father, we thank you for the message of faith, encouragement, and hope in that song. Lord, we know that you are the God of power. You are the God of battles and will not give up. You have called us into service, into the ministry, and Lord, we know that you will never lose any battle and you will never fail. Therefore, Lord, we commit everything into your hand going on in the various churches that our ministers here represent. Lord, we're praying that you'll get rid of those problems and the church will begin to grow according to your plan and promises in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, whatever the source of the problem, sometimes because of our own foolishness in the past, sometimes because of our ignorance in the past, and sometimes because of people that have set themselves up as opposers in the church of the living God. Lord, we pray that whatever the problems or whatever the reasons of the problems, you'll take everything away by your mighty power in Jesus' name. Amen. So that when we go back, we'll start afresh. We'll begin to build afresh. Lord, we are not giving up. We have already consecrated and committed ourselves to your service. And we are not looking back. We know that all the strength we need, all the ability we need, you can supply. And we'll rather depend upon you and not trust in the arm of the flesh. Lord, we're praying that as we go back, that you will prepare us for a greater ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. That, Lord, you'll give us the wisdom. You'll give us the understanding. You'll give us the strength to be able to carry through in our ministries in Jesus' name. Amen. As we consider triumph in spiritual warfare, even today, we pray that you will open our eyes of understanding. And we pray, Lord, that from what you will teach us and reveal to us in your word, you'll give us the secrets of the spiritual warfare. And through this, you'll give us the victory. And we will not fall anymore in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold our hands, O Lord. Go before us in the battle, O Lord. And make us triumphant and victorious to the glory of your name, to the expansion of the work, and to the joy of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we're considering an important subject for every minister. And it's a subject of triumph in spiritual warfare. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now, Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. Paul the Apostle, that knew the mysteries of the gospel, the secrets of success, and obviously what faced whatever any other minister might have faced in his own day. He gave thanks to the Lord and said, it's the Lord that causes us to be triumphant in Christ. And he says that he does that by his knowledge in every place. We need to understand that though we are ministers of, of the gospel, servants of the Most High God, Ambassadors of Christ, shepherds to Christ's flock, preachers of God's imperishable eternal truth, heralds of the coming king, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Above all that, beyond all that, and in all that, we're soldiers of Christ. And as soldiers, we have a fight to fight. If there is a fight, then there is opposition. If there is opposition, then it is so important for us that we must overcome, we must triumph. The Lord has called us to be soldiers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, we are told thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But ministers and preachers of the gospel are often ignorant of Satan's warfare and the mode of his oppression. And here is where many people have lost 
the battle. The enemy takes advantage of our ignorance. You know, if you are fighting an unseen enemy, a well-armed enemy who is determined to conquer and you are not vigilant and you do not even know that there is a fight going on, the enemy will take advantage of that ignorance and the ignorant and the unprepared will be defeated before the middle of the battle. You'll remember that Belshazzar was ignorant that there was any army behind the walls of Babylon. And because he felt that Babylon was impregnable, no enemy could enter, he was drinking with his lords, concubines, and the people that he had collected together. He even took the vessels of the house of the Lord. And then while the army of the Persians and the Medes were all set and ready, he didn't know. He was ignorant. He saw the handwriting on the wall that the end had come. And before he knew it, he was slain, he was destroyed. You also need to remember the case of Sisera, the Bora and Barak have been fighting. And Sisera had escaped. When he escaped, he got to the house of a woman and told this woman, if anybody asked of me, just tell them, there's nobody in here. And the woman said, you are safe. There's no problem. And he said, can I have some water to drink? And the woman said, you need more than water. You're so tired, you're so worn out. You need to take some milk. And he took a bottle of milk. And he thought, no doubt, the battle is over. And because of that ignorance, that's how he died. He did not know that that woman herself was one of the warriors. And sometimes we do not know that some of the women that will come across, they are part of the agents of the devil that he uses in fighting. We put all our hearts in their hand. We put all our resources in their hand. We put all our secrets in their hands. And they tell us, don't worry about it. You need water, I'll give you milk. And then they become the source of the death of the ministry. And they become the source of the ruin of the ministry that God has given in our hands. Abner had been on the side of Saul. And Joab did not like that. But you see, David was a man of a soft heart, like we said on Wednesday night. And so eventually when Abner came and Abner told David that the hearts of all the children of Israel, they are after you. David said, that's all right. And David was even happy to make him one of the captains. But Joab was secretly planning that he will destroy Abner. And uh, Joab went to Abner and said, my brother, and he embraced him. And he took him aside to talk to him peaceably. Abner was a mighty warrior. He was a man that could fight at the snap of the finger. But he didn't know there was any battle. But Joab was all ready. And while Abner was unprepared, Joab took out the weapon and he killed Abner without any resistance. The enemy will often take advantage of our ignorance, unpreparedness to fight. That is why we need to get prepared, because the enemies are watching. But thank God, we too, we are now watching. And we are going to overcome in the name of Jesus Christ. In this battle, we need to know who the enemy is. We need to know what his weapons and methods are. We need to know what our triumph is. Three points. Number one, our enemy. Number two, his methods and weapons. Number three, our triumph. As the Lord has called us, we must understand that the devil hates God, hates Christ, hates the gospel, and he hates men and women. He doesn't want men and women to be saved. And because we have received the ministry, and we have received the call, and we have committed ourselves to doing what the devil hates. 
Because of that, he also hates us with special hatred. And therefore, he is our enemy. Because he is the enemy of God, of Christ, and the gospel. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 27, verse 28, and verse 29. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. Brothers and sisters, when we think of what we have been preaching, by the grace of God, by the, the enablement of the Lord, and sometimes we see the outcome in the lives of some members of the church. Sometimes people might ask us, have you not preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? How is it then we see all these things that are contrary to what we have been emphasizing in the church? Our only answer is that an enemy has done this. It's beyond the people. It's not just the people alone. Oh yes, they have their responsibilities and they have some things that they have done to be wrong. But in the final analysis, we must understand that whatever is going wrong, an enemy is involved to tease us, to tempt us, to torment us, and to make us give up, to try us. In um, verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And so our enemy is the devil and we're told in first peter chapter 5 we need to open these verses of scripture and know what who is the enemy first peter chapter 5 verse 8 be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour the devil is not in this world to play. He's here for a warfare. The devil is not in any place to entertain. He's there to fight. And Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, talked to the people and he said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, not as a lamb trying to make peace but as a lion wanting to crush, wanting to destroy, wanting to devour anything that stands in his way. He has a long-range plan, as well as a short-range plan. He has an ultimate plan of ruling. Since he wanted to rule at the first beginning, and he was cast out of heaven, he had not lost that um, desire. You know, when Jesus came into this world, he said, all these kingdoms, they belong to me. And he said, if you bow down, if you worship me, rather than worship God, I'll pass on everything unto you. And Jesus replied, it is written, God only will you worship. And again, he came. And Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, he has nothing in me. And he tried to get through Judas Iscariot. He even tried a Peter, and Jesus said, Peter, Simon, Simon, you know what? Satan has desired to have you. You are my instrument. You are a great instrument in my hand. And as the devil has known that I am putting a lot in you, and wanting to do a lot through you, he also wants to have you, to sift you like wheat, and take every heavenly divine thing out of you. But Peter, I prayed for you. But you know, Peter told the Lord Jesus, he said, I don't need all that prayer, I'm all right. Even if all these other people go back, you can trust me. And Jesus said, when you are converted, you know, Jesus just went on saying what he wanted to say, strengthen your brethren. But you know, Peter did not know there was any trouble at all. But you know, the Bible says, the devil is our adversary. The Greek word translated devil can also be translated slanderer. He slanders. He brings up false accusation, sometimes in your own mind, to accuse. Are you qualified for the ministry? Do you think that God has called you? And he brings doubt almost every time. You know, even when we have done something by the power of the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, and now we tell ourselves, now I will never doubt. Look at that miracle that God did. 
Look at those people that came to the Lord. Look at the joy of the Lord. Even when we have assured ourselves, we will never doubt now, I know I am called into the ministry. Look at that message that God gave me and I preached it and it was a wonderful effect it had on the people and you think you'll never doubt anymore. The third day, you are doubting already. And you are saying, am I really called? What am I doing in this ministry? Is this church or denomination where I am? Is this the purpose of God for me? When you are very, very sure before, we have an enemy. We have an adversary. And it's a slanderer. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he's the accuser of the ministers. And he goes about as a running lion, seeking whom he might destroy. Jesus Christ himself said, the thief comes for only one purpose, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I'm sure we understand this, but... For the purpose of making it clearer, let us break into two. One, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against the principalities and powers that has possessed flesh and blood. You see, we do not see the devil. Neither do we see demons or evil spirits. But evil spirits will dwell in men or women, in flesh and blood, so that those evil spirits will use them as instruments in fighting. The Lord had just been revealing to the disciples that he was going to die for the salvation of humanity. And here was his trusted disciple and trusted friend, and he said, Lord Jesus, that will never happen to you. And remember, we're not fighting flesh and blood, but we're fighting principalities and powers in flesh and blood. And Jesus looked at Peter, flesh and blood, and he saw something behind that flesh and blood. And he saw something, something within that flesh and blood. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, not Simon, but Satan. Which means we're not fighting flesh and blood, but sometimes there are principalities and powers in dwelling in flesh and blood, standing behind flesh and blood, motivating flesh and blood, empowering flesh and blood, confusing flesh and blood. And these people that are flesh and blood, but empowered and motivated by principalities and powers, they oppose us. And we fight the principalities and powers within them or behind them. Let's look at that verse again. But we wrestle. Paul said, we wrestle. We, Paul, and Timothy, and Titus, and Silas, and anyone that had been on the team with Paul. He said, we wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Sometimes we say that we've got a vision to go to a particular area to go to minister. And we're so sure, we told all our people, we have been working in a particular city. And in that city, because maybe we've been there for a long time, or because we have gained some experience in dealing with the rulers of the powers of the air in that area, we're successful. And then now, we say that we're going to a particular place. And that place even appears smaller in the physical that place appears simpler in the physical. The people are not as intelligent, as argumentative as where we were before. And we say, no doubt, if God had given me wisdom in the other place, now I can go to this new place and I can go and minister. There will be no trouble at all. In fact, I may not have to pray as much as I prayed in the other place. I may not have to fast as much as I fasted in the other place. And then we, we add some messages that were just fantastic. When we were in the other city, we preached that message and see people rushing to the Lord and rushing to the altar. And see people getting healed and see people just uh, receiving the Lord and having miracles. Then all the files and all the, um, all the pile of those messages we took, like, we took along with us. Then we got to this new area, not knowing that 
The method that conquered Jericho will not conquer Ai. And the method that conquered the Amalekites will not conquer the Ammonites. Because we do not know that the king of Bashan is different from the king of Og. And it's different from the king of Jericho. And it's different from the Gibeonites. And because we do not know that these kings are the rulers of the powers of the air, that they are different, we go with the same outline, we go with the same messages, and we get to that same place. And then we come on the stage, we preach that same fiery, wonderful, effective sermon that got many people to the Lord in the other city. And after we are preaching, after we are preached, the people are looking at us like this. We pray for the sake and nobody ever gets healed. What have I done? Have I backslidden? Did I miss the will of the Lord? Didn't the Lord tell me to come to this place? Yes, he did. But you didn't know that the rulers of the darkness of this world are different from location to location. The way they keep their captives are different from village to city. It's different from stage to stage. And whenever you get to a new area, you need to understand that we wrestle. And it doesn't matter how many years we have been preaching. And it doesn't matter how many years God has been giving us success. We wrestle. And we wrestle against principalities and against powers. Against organized rulers of darkness. Of this world. And then it says against spiritual wickedness in high places. That means against wicked spirits. Spiritual wickedness. Now in English language you say that wickedness is personified. It's just like when you say the wicked. A wicked man. Then instead of saying the wicked or a wicked man, you say that man is not only wicked, he is wickedness itself. That's weakness person weakness, uh, wickedness personified. And then spiritual wickedness. That means a person that you can call wickedness, but in the spiritual way. But now when you turn it around, it's a wicked, wicked spirit in high places. We're wrestling against them. So then that shows us that there is a battle going on. And the purpose of the enemy, his determined plan, is to do seven things. I give you those seven things. Number one, to sift you as wheat. To sift you as wheat. I'm sure you have seen our sisters, our wives, when they sift the corn. They grind the corn. And then they take the sweet, uh, the sift, and they put the ground corn inside. They might put some water. And then you have the other part going into the bowl beneath. What are they doing? They are sifting. They are separating the real food value from the other chaff. What's the devil doing? The devil is trying to put every minister into a sift and sifting and sifting. So that the real heavenly quality will pass to the bowl below. He will, so that all the attributes, all the things that are good in that individual that the Lord saw in calling that person to say, you are going to work for me, the devil will sift everything into a bowl. Then he will carry that bowl and carry it away. The child that remains in the, in the sift, he says, you can take that and go and serve your Jesus. And if you don't know what that means, then we're ignorant of his devices. And you know many times, the things that really matter in our lives, the power of God, the spirit of God, and the things that God has put in our heart, the devil might sift everything away, and he leaves the knowledge, the carnal knowledge, the secular knowledge, the language, the English language that we know. He says, well, I'm not fighting with your grammar. Go with your grammar, go and be preaching. And all the knowledge about politics, you know, that's not my concern. Go with that and be preaching. But the real thing that is important, the power of the Spirit of God, he sifts everything away if we allow him. That's one of his purposes. That if he cannot totally kill a man, if he cannot totally withdraw him from the ministry, he will sift away everything that is important. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. 
And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's his determined plan. And that is on his unchanging purpose for any minister to drain away every heavenly quality from every one of us. But it is as we are vigilant that we are not going to allow him to do that. Number two, to devour, to destroy the life and the ministry. To destroy, to devour the life and the ministry. In John chapter 10, the first part of verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, I know you know these verses, but sometimes it's necessary that we point out some things. In the construction of the Greek, what Jesus was saying, and even in the construction of the English, you see, if Jesus had said, the thief cometh to steal, to kill, to destroy. That would have been strong, but not strong enough yet. That's why Jesus in the Greek language put a very serious construction on it. And he said, the devil cometh with a determined purpose, with a plan that he will not allow to be, he will not allow himself to be diverted. With such a determination and commitment to steal, he's made up his mind that this is what he will do. And he's not going to take any difficulty in his way. And he's going to do it at all cost if he can. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. We've known cases in which a person will be living happily with his family. No problem at all. Even as some believer. And then the, bro the man gets converted. Child of God. And is really beaming for the Lord, shining for the Lord. And, of course, the family life continues. And God will be blessing them, just as a believer. And then he receives a call, and he gets into the ministry. And trouble starts in the family. And um, he looked at the reasons why. And he said, five years ago, we were happily married. Ten years ago, we've been happy together. This woman had never done anything or said anything that will make me sad. Even as an unbeliever, it appeared that God gave me a very special family. And when I became a believer, the Lord just uh, gave me this uh, special wife. I don't know why now. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to use that thing where it will hurt you the most. He knows that you can face anything outside. But he says, let me see how you face the one inside. And the wife also will not understand why all those things are happening. And the wife will be saying, well, we're happy before my husband got into the ministry. And everything was all right. What's the use? What, why all this? The devil wants to kill, destroy the ministry, the life of that individual. Have you found cases where we have children? And even before we started preaching healing, before we started preaching that God can heal, we believed in healing all along. But, I mean, before we really started preaching it forcefully, our children were all well. The children were delivered and there was no problem at all. We were not preachers at that time. And then later, we became preachers. And after we became preachers, our children became more sick than they were sick before we were preachers. Why? Because he wants to divert your attention. If you can pour all the money through taking care of sick children, then there's no money to take care of the gospel. If you can put all your attention on this, the first child is sick today, they brought the second child back from school, and uh, the third child, something uh, happened to him, we do not even know the medical name for that thing, he knows that he can stop your going for that other crusade. And even when you go for that other crusade, your mind will still be at home. The thief is coming with the planned purpose, with a determined goal to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
How happy were you when you were a believer? Oh, you were happy. I mean, when you first became a believer, happy. And it appears you were saying, it's like I'm walking in the mid-air. Just happy. And then you received the call. And you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, I know that when I get into this ministry and I begin to preach the gospel, oh, I will be happy in my life. Then you begin to compare. When I came to the Lord, how happy I was. When I received the Lord as my personal savior, the joy of the Lord, oh, it was fantastic. I know that if I take this necessary step of faith and I receive this call from the Lord, I'll be so happy like an angel. Now you are a minister. How happy are you? You know, sometimes you don't even know why you are sad. You just discover in the middle of the day when you are preparing for a great revival, a great preaching, something to happen in the evening. All of a sudden, you just have this sadness. It's like a blanket. It just covered you all together. And you said, what happened? You looked at your life. There was no sin. You looked at everything that was done ye yesterday, last week, last month, there was nothing at all. And you are wondering, what's the cause of all this? But as you are thinking about it and looking at it, you cannot find a single reason on the face of the earth why you are sad like that. And instead of preparing for the meeting in the evening, it's just that sadness. And then you came uh, to the meeting and the publicity had been made. Everything has been, um, you know, going on on a large, large scale. Eventually, you are tempted to call your assistant and say, uh, I don't know why. I fasted, I prayed, I prepared for these meetings, but uh, would you take over? But maybe you have a second thought, and of course the devil will want to take advantage of your ignorance and will say, uh -huh, you want to call your assistant. They will say that maybe you have gone to commit sin. All these things that were publicized, that you, the pastor, or the evangelist, you have to take care of. Maybe you've gone to do something wrong. So you check yourself, you say, I will do it. And then they are singing, and while they are singing, it appears that uh, the singing is even bothering you. They are not singing well. The people who had been singing well before, the song today is not good. And all of a sudden, the generator stopped working. Nepa has taken off light. That has not happened to you before. It does happen. Everything all together at the same time. And eventually, by the time you get there, you are like a hen that fell into water. And while you are standing there, and you say, in Jesus' name, something said within you that's a lie. And you say, God is going to do great things here today. Something said within you, why are you deceiving yourself and deceiving the people? And all the things you had planned before that you were going to preach, the way you will start, the direction you will go, you forgot everything, you have an inner battle. And while you are preaching, while your words are going on and going forth, inside your mind, back, back in your mind, you are thinking, are they hearing what I'm saying? Are they really sink? Is the word sinking into their heart? You are looking at their faces. If you are really tempted to uh, doubt that uh, there's nothing going on, you will ask them, church or people are you really hearing what i'm saying some of them will say yes but the yes even bothers you and eventually you round up everything and then you say we're going to pray you say in your mind you say you want to give altar call and the devil says you give altar call why do you want to give yourself public disgrace you knew nobody understood what you were saying then you say, okay, I will start by getting people healed. Uh -huh. Now you will see that you will fail. How can you get anybody healed in this condition? Then eventually the devil might say, why not tell the people that uh, today is just the beginning. Come back tomorrow. It will be a wonderful day. And then you round up the meeting and you pray and you pray. And then you ask somebody to take over. You run back home. You lie down on the bed or you kneel down on the, on the plank and you say, God, what have I done? God, what have I done? Didn't you call me? That's a battle. That's what we're talking about, the spiritual warfare. The members in the church, they don't know what is going on. Some of them are not even praying for us. Oh, they say, Pastor, is a man of power. He's a man of God. He doesn't need our prayer. Oh, we need prayer. No wonder Paul, the apostle, said, children of God, pray for us. 
We need prayer. Pray for us. Because there is a spiritual battle. I said, number one, the devil's purpose is to sift. Number two, the devil's purpose is to destroy and to devour the life and the ministry. Number three, the devil's purpose is to corrupt your mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve, through its subtlety, so your minds shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Sometimes he wants to corrupt our minds in various, various ways. You know, sometimes uh, you're so happy that now there's uh, cleanness of heart or purity of heart that had been your vision, your desire for a long time. Now I have got it. All of a sudden, something dirty that took place 30 years ago in the primary school will just flash into your mind. You are not thinking about that occasion of the primary school event. You are not thinking about anything. In fact, as bad as the devil is, you might be in the middle of even reading the Bible. And just all of a sudden from nowhere, that dirty thing that happened 30 years ago in primary school will just come to your mind. You shake it up. Say, no. I'm a minister now. Those were primary school childhood days. But trying to shake it up, you can't shake it up. And before you know anything that is happening, it's already. It's like when kerosene gets into one spot of the cloth, it's spreading in that thing. And already the smell of that kerosene, you're even uh, trying to feel. That's the devil. If you know how to triumph, we'll talk about our triumph later. But I'm just talking about the problems now. That you know that the devil sometimes will want to do all these things. All that he wants is that we will not continue the preaching of the gospel. But he's a liar. And he's a father of lies. Amen. Whatever is happening, we're going to continue preaching the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. But he will want to corrupt the mind. And sometimes you know, you're reading the Bible. And if this has not happened to somebody before, he'll wonder how can that happen to a minister of God. And then you see God in the Bible, and the devil will say, that's you. You'll look back, who is saying that? Then you'll see, God said, worship me. And the devil will say, that means that people should worship you. You become afraid. God, what have I done? I am not God, I'm not God, I'm not God. If it happens at the pulpit, while you're sitting down there, just looking at some verses, and it comes to corrupt your mind like that, if you're not careful, you'll be praying aloud. Say no, in the name of Jesus, no. Church, the church will be wondering what's happening to the pastor. But thank God, I'll show you when I've given you all these things, how to have a trial. Sometimes there are cases of people reading the Bible. I'm talking of the way that the devil will fight terrible, terrible battle. And you come across the word of God and it says Jesus saves. Instead of Jesus, your mind will be calling Satan. And you'll see it in the Bible. Jesus saves or Jesus is doing something or Jesus is doing that. And the devil will just stand there and instead of that Jesus, it will be Satan. That your mind will be a uh, calling you'll say no I believe Jesus I'm a child of God I'm a minister of the gospel all that you wanted to do that time you pack everything aside you begin to fight that thing you begin to fight that thing a spiritual warfare to corrupt the mind number four to deceive to lead astray and to seduce into falsehood to deceive that's his purpose. That's his plan. That's his strategy. I said number four, to deceive, to lead astray, and to seduce into falsehood. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits. 
Of course, you know too that there are women. And as we talk about this, we, we talk about this in the midst of the people that are fighting, fighting against the devil. When Saul died, David heard about it. You know what he said? He said, tell it not in Gath. Do not say this among the Philistines, how the mighty has fallen. And there are some things we cannot say in Gath, among the Philistines, how the mighty are falling. And sometimes the scandals that come out. And we shouldn't point at anybody. Because if somebody has fallen, remember that the aim of the devil is not just one person. The aim of the devil is all the ministers. If he has only got one person, he, has, he is not resting. He is not saying, well, I think let me leave the rest of the people alone. If he can get that man, he'll be assuring himself, if I can get that one, all these other ones, I can easily get them. And he'll be trying. Now I talk about seducing spirits. To seduce means to entice. To entice to the point that you will not... Um, you will not know what to do. You see that young man yesterday that gave the testimony at the Miracle Revival service. Just a young man. Just uh, a believer. He said he had, belonged, he had become a Christian. A child of God. And um, he said he was before very, very dirty. That he couldn't live a single day without women. And then he got born again. In his own language, he said he still was not having the victory. Don't let us mind his theology. He's not a preacher. Don't let us mind what he said. But let us just grab the point that we need. He wasn't trying to teach. He was just saying like a young convert, what happened to him? And he said he wanted to really live the victorious life. And eventually he said that he got the victorious life. But the devil knew that that boy, that young man, that couldn't live with a, without a woman a single day before. He was in his own house. In the past, when he was a sinner, he would go out and be looking for prostitutes. But Satan said, uh -uh, what's, happening, what's happening to you? Okay, if you are not going to look for prostitutes outside, I will send one of my messengers to you. And that lady came into his room, and that lady began to tease and began to probably undress. Think about that. I learned about a dear brother. A wonderful brother. Many, many years ago, he had become born again. Child of God. Now the Lord has blessed him in his life. But you know, when he was born again, he will read the Bible, he will pray. This particular day, he knelt down with his eyes closed, just praying to the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Just happy in the Lord. But the door was not closed. And I was a lady living in the same house. And that lady had already entered the room very quietly. But this young man at that time, is not young now, but he was young at that time. He was busy just worshipping and praising the Lord and just, just praying. The woman had totally undressed. And this man just finished praying. And... Uh, just getting up, he saw that woman completely undressed. He ran out. And then he rebuked that woman, that special grace, that special anointing. He began to rebuke that woman. First of all, he was shocked, first of all. But after that initial shock, then he began to rebuke that woman until he was shame. That woman went out. But you know, those are those who are even believers, ordinary believers. If anything happened to them, that's a private problem. When something happens to a minister, it's no private problem, it's a public problem. And you know, we will not know how terrible the devil was. I will be saying, hey, look at so and so, overseer of a particular denomination. Now he's falling. Don't rejoice. The enemy that got him is not resting. He wants to get another person. And when somebody has fallen like that, and we're publicizing it and rejoicing over it, 
And I was saying, I knew it would happen to him. I knew their plans uh, preached the gospel. They were too proud. We will do this, we will do this. We're going to wreck the enemies, uh, the enemies camp. And we didn't know what they were doing in secret. Don't rejoice, my brother. The mighty are falling. Don't talk about it in God. Don't talk about it among the Philistines. If you talk about it at all, let it be with tears, with agony in your heart, and with fear in your heart. Because if the devil has got somebody like that, who am I? Who are you? If the devil could be aiming at Peter, said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, to sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, I prayed for you. Let's pray for one another. Because the temptations of ministers are great. The problems of ministers are great. And the warfare against the ministers of the, of the gospel, they are very, very great. He wants to seduce through very many people. You know, sometimes uh, those of us who uh, go on crusades, and those of us who see the, uh, some results, when somebody doesn't have results, the devil doesn't worry. When nobody gets saved, what does he worry about that? When nobody gets healed, what, the devil, what does the devil worry about that? But when you are getting results, then he will send some of these uh, people and he will seduce. But that's his tactics. He sends his agents to deceive, to lead astray, and to seduce into falsehood. Sometimes into false doctrine. And when we see somebody who has been preaching the balanced gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ before and has gone away into false doctrine, brothers and sisters, don't let us rejoice. You know, sometimes, uh, you know why we rejoice sometimes? Because of our carnality. Because we say, well, he has destroyed his own ministry. He has destroyed his own message. His church people now, they know that he's not preaching the right thing. Therefore, the people that discover he's not preaching the right thing, they come to my church. And we tell those members that come, we say, now you have come, you have left uh, your church, your pastor went into error and went into falsehood. We we'll welcome you. Here we stand on sound doctrine. My brother, the person who also went back into false doctrine, he started sound before. The devil that got him has not rested. He still wants to get another person. Don't rejoice. Pray for him. Let there be tears in your eyes. And really set time apart, praying for the people that are falling. Number five, to ensnare and to enslave. The devil has in his purpose to ensnare and to enslave. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Number six, he wants to hinder the progress of the gospel. The reason why the devil is fighting with his agents and against the children of God is so that he will hinder the progress of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, we need to know that there are millions in this nation that are not born again yet. In fact, in my studies, I've discovered that if the statistics have not changed, there are about 18 million people. If you have the book, Operation World. Operation World is a book that gives you the information about the level of Christianity all over the world. And it talks about Nigeria. Although I know that some of our brethren who are studying about the Christian um, standard and the Christian statistics and figures in Nigeria, they say that the information in Operation World is not even adequate enough. But at present, that is the most adequate information that we have. And if you have, if you get that book in any of the reputable bookshops in the country, it will be good. Operation World, that's the title of the book. In that book, we're told that there are about 18 million people that say that they are Christians, but they are nominal. They don't go to church, many of them. They might go at Easter, they might go at Christmas, they might go at a special location. There are millions of people for us to win to the Lord. You see, all those people, they are not resistant uh, to the gospel. In a way, they feel that Christianity is their religion, but yet they are not born again. And there is much work for you and I to do. But the point is this, that the devil knows that there are a lot of people still to get saved. 
but he wants to hinder the progress of the gospel. And if we don't know that that is his aim, that is his purpose, we might not be fighting right. We might not be working right. And sometimes it diverts us to think about and to talk about things that are not important so that we can leave the essential, the important, and the urgent. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He knew that if Paul got to all the places he would have gone, he'll be preaching the gospel, he'll be teaching those Thessalonians. Paul had been there before at Thessalonica. And the Lord worked mightily with him. And he taught the people, and those people were so ready to learn. And those people were just sinking in, they were just um, receiving the word of the Lord, that as Paul the apostle was teaching them, and now he wanted to go back for follow-up. He wanted to go back to strengthen the work he had started, and to continue the building that he had laid the foundation. But Satan hindered. That's part of the purpose of the devil to hinder the progress of the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, when you want to hinder something, how do you do it? Or when somebody wants to hinder something, how does he do it? The devil is intelligent. But he shouldn't play with his intelligence. And the devil doesn't do something like a foolish uh, personality. Very, very cunning, very, very wise, having foresight. You have a large bowl of... Um, what do you like to eat? Eba or amala or fufu or whatever it is. How do you finish that thing if you wanted to finish it? A bite at a time. And while you take just a muscle, all the other parts of the bowl of food, if they could reason, they might be saying, oh, look at that one. That one is gone. That muscle is gone. That muscle is gone. They do not know the purpose of the eater. He wants to finish everything. Only a bite at a time. That's how the devil fights. He takes a church at a time. A ministry at a time. A minister at a time. He won't uh, try to, you know, just have everybody destroyed at a time. And the other ministers that are still free, and uh, they say, well, we never have any hindrance. I hear about that church. They say that they have financial hindrance. They wanted to pay the gospel. There is no money. Thank God for us in this church. We don't have any financial problem. Wait and see. In that other place, um, they have, they're having this plan and this goal. And when all the equipment was to be brought in, the devil went to one of the people that was to donate and give all the things that ought to be given and said, do you know how those ministers are spending your money? All the vision and all the things they are telling you, they want to go to village and preach, they want to go to this and preach. Do you know how they are spending the money? How about the money that you gave last year? Do you know how they spent it? They are just enjoying themselves. And that man is just an ordinary member in the church. Ordinary in the sense that he doesn't know he's the devil talking. He thinks that he is the one reasoning and he's not the one. And eventually he will say, maybe if he wanted to give 5,000 naira before. Or even 20,000 naira before. And they have the money in our churches. But it's because they're hearing the devil more than hearing God. That's why the money doesn't come. And eventually they will say, well, I don't, know, I don't even know how they are spending the money. And instead of maybe uh, 1,000 naira, 5,000 naira, he will put down 5 naira or 10 naira. And he say, then he will say, if the pastor talks again, I will know what to do. I'm still thinking about it. Then maybe the next month, the pastor said, look, we should have been in that village now. We should have been in that other place now. We should have been in that place now. And he wanted, and he said, I think I should do something now. And the devil went again and said, you're going to put your money down. Are you the only one in the church? Look at how many were. If this one will contribute 50 naira, 50 naira, 50 naira, 50 naira. If everybody will contribute 50 naira, all the, the money will be all right. And the man said, yes, that's right. 
And instead of giving the 5,000 that God wanted him to give, he will calculate and say, I'm not the only one in the church. All these people, even if they give 50-50, that's enough. He'll put 50 naira down. The other fellow that actually had 50 naira that he should put down, the devil will go to that person and say, your children will not eat, your wife will not eat, you are going to put all the 50 naira you have in your hand, you are going to put everything down. And go ahead and do it and go hungry. And the man will put five naira down. Eventually, after six months, there's no generator, there is no uh, van, there is nothing at all. The devil trying to hinder the gospel. How do you think the devil hinders the gospel? By making all the ministers sick. Uh -uh. He may make one minister sick. He may cut off financial support from another minister. He may bring out family problems for another minister. He may bring another thing for another minister to hinder the progress of the gospel. That's why he's fighting. And if we do not know that the devil is fighting, we will not know how to have the victory. But thank God, we know. And we're going to have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Number seven. To cause you to forsake God's eternal plan for the salvation of multitudes. In Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 21. From, the time, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Here the Lord wanted to give himself so that God's eternal plan for the salvation of the whole world will be fulfilled. And here Satan, behind Peter, wanted to hinder that purpose of God in Jesus' life. And in the same way that Satan works today, that he will try to get us away from God's eternal plan. He wants us to forsake God's eternal plan for the salvation of multitudes. That's what the enemy is trying to do. Number one, to save you like wheat. Number two, to devour, to destroy life and ministry. Number three, to corrupt your mind. Number four, to deceive, to lead astray, and to seduce into falsehood. Number four, to ensnare and to enslave. Number five, to um, Number five, to ensnare. Number six, to hinder the gospel progress. And number seven, to cause you to forsake God's eternal plan for the salvation of multitudes. How does he do it? What are his methods? Now the devil doesn't come in the physical. When Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your enemy, your adversary, the devil, is going about, running as a lion. Now, if you are watching for a lion, you'll never see the lion. Because it's not talking about the physical. It's talking about the spiritual. When he talks about a running lion, he's talking about his nature. He's talking about his devilishness. He's talking about his wickedness. But then, he doesn't appear in the open for you to see you only discern spiritually if you can discern so he fights with methods and weapons Satan in his fight against ministers uses three major areas number one evil spirits number two human agents number three he uses temptations number one evil spirits Already I have read it to you, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and also we're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. But then when the devil uses evil spirits, what do those evil spirits do? I'll give you the references and give you the comments. You're preachers of the gospel yourself, and our time is going. 
evil spirits cause sickness. In Luke chapter 13, verse 11, Jesus spoke about that woman that had the spirit of infirmity, bent down, bent low for 18 years. And sometimes evil spirits can cause sickness to family members or sickness even to the minister. You know, sometimes a person is a minister of the gospel and he begins to have a so terrible pain in the brain. And um, he then tells himself that, what am I going to do now? As a minister, it will be a dangerous, terrible thing if I go to the psychiatric hospital because that will blow up and then I might lose my ministry. But every time he tries to read, read Christian books or read tracts or read uh, whatever it is or read the Bible, the heat will be so much in the head. And then the thought will come to him, because of this problem, this heat in the head, I think I ought to be careful about reading. So he cuts down reading the Bible. And people will not see that Satan is fighting at all. Not only that, every time he begins to think, and he says, well, if we're really going to have this work going on, we have to ve plan very well, plan this strategy, reach that village, reach that local government area, strengthen the headquarters, and do this and that. The moment he begins to think very seriously, it affects the brain. There's so much heat in the head, and therefore he says, I must cool down. I mustn't think too much. He mustn't read too much. He mustn't think too much. Anytime he's awake, and he's awake more than 9 o'clock in the evening, he begins to feel so much terrible uh, thing in the head. And he says, I must not be awake too long. He tries to sleep at 10 o'clock. The devil knows that most of our meetings are in the evenings. It has to be because the people we want to talk to during the week, because we cannot wait for Sunday alone before we preach the gospel. They are in the offices during the day. It's in the evening we really get them. All our crusades and everything. Now the devil is bringing a problem in the head. I mustn't treat too much. I mustn't think too much. I mustn't keep awake too much. That's him using his method and weapon against that minister. And he can do it against the family. He can do it against members of the church. You know what? When... You announce on Sunday, last Sunday, we lost so-and-so, so-and-so died. Then, two weeks after that, another person died. You announce again because you have to announce to get the funeral service um, done. So-and-so died. One month after that, you announce again, so-and-so died. The people in the church will be saying, ah, three people in two months. If you make the next announcement, you lose a, a percentage of that church. The devil is doing it. He knows what he's doing. The people on the street may not see the devil in that. All they see in that is that, well, there is a problem. He uses evil spirits to cause sicknesses. Number two, to cause vexation and torment. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. Number three, he uses confusion and conflict, strife and division. Judges chapter 9, verses 22 to, to 24. Evil spirit causing confusion, causing disagreement. And you know, sometimes in churches, we have uh, divisions, we have strife. And many times, we're looking at flesh and blood. We're fighting flesh and blood. And we're saying that uh, so-and-so's family is always a problem to this church. Yes, but there's something behind that personality, that individual. Every time confusion is coming up, conflict is coming up, strife and divisions are coming up, we, we need to begin to see that sometimes it's evil spirits. That is causing all those things. If you read those references, I've dictated later, you'll see that that is, that is the work of evil spirits. Sometimes utterances and prophecies that scatter the flock. We come to the church, and um, somebody said he's got a revelation, he's got a prophecy. And without sharing it with the pastor, he comes to the church. 
And it says, thus says the Lord. The Lord said there is somebody in this church that is not allowing the church to make progress. Somebody is committing adultery with somebody's wife in this church. And before you go there to tap him on the shoulder and say, that's enough, that's enough, we'll pray for that person. He says, Mr. So-and-so, if you don't repent, God will judge you because you are having immoral dealings with Mrs. So-and-so. That church will scatter. And the man says, it's not my fault, it's what God put in my mouth that I said. That, com that thing, utterance, or so-called prophecy that will scatter the whole flock, that's of the devil. Even if anything was going on, how will God handle it? Will God handle it to destroy his own work? To destroy the flock of God? Therefore, you can see the method that the way it is done to destroy the work of the Lord, it is the devil behind it using his agent, using the evil spirits. In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 12, verse 14, and verses 17 to 23, Micaiah said, I see the sheep, the children of Israel, they scattered without any shepherd. And he said, a lying spirit was in the mouth of the false prophets. And he was saying, go up to Ramos Gilead and you will win the battle. But he said, the consequence of that prophecy is that they are going to scatter the children of Israel and the leader and the king will die. And Ahab said, lock up this man and let him be given the bread of adversity before I come back. Micaiah said, if you come back from that battle, the Lord has not sent me. You see, the evil spirits can be lying spirits in the mouths of the people that say they are prophesying and their prophecy is scattering the flock, destroying the flock. Prophecy should build up. Prophecy should edify. Prophecy should encourage the people of God not to destroy. Number five, strong, seducing influence. Seriously diverting people's mind from the truth. Strong, seducing influence. Seriously diverting people's minds from the truth. First Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. I told you that the devil can use evil spirits, and he does. Two, he uses human agents against the minister and against the church. And whenever he does that, what does he do? Number one, he, he does, he causes resistance to the free flow of the anointed message. Acts chapter 13, verses, one, verses 6 to 12, Paul the Apostle was preaching the gospel to the governor. And there was a sorcerer. And he was seeking to divert the governor from the truth. And Paul preached, and Paul preached, and Paul preached. But this sorcerer was trying to divert the attention of the, of the governor. And Paul stopped his preaching. And the Bible says, all of a sudden, he was full of the Holy Ghost. And he set his eyes on him. And said, you child of the devil, agent of the devil, full of all subtlety. And then he said, you'll be blind for a season. That's authority. That's what we were talking about last night. Receiving the power, releasing the power, and responding to the power. When that power is there, you are able to crush and quench all those things that the devil may want to do. And thank God we can have that power. And so Paul manifested that power, and that man immediately became blind. And the governor was surprised, was amazed at the effect of the gospel. And then he told, uh, he responded to the gospel, and then he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the hardening of hearts, not allowing the truth to penetrate. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Together with Exodus chapter 7, verses 20 to 22. The magicians, they were the, when Moses and Aaron performed those miracles, the magicians also duplicated those things. And the duplicating of those miracles by the magicians hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And when there are people 
that have occultic powers hiding in the church, and everything you try to do, they try to bring a duplicate, they say, well, now the pastor is talking about Holy Spirit and uh, gifts of the Holy Ghost. All that, uh, all that is, uh, I don't believe all that. I can do every one of those things that the pastor says he's doing. And the members will say, ah, what do you mean? Do it. And then he begins to use uh, the evil things that he has learned somewhere else. Not in the Bible. He begins to do those things. And then this other fellow will go and call members of the church and say, ah, I saw something Oh. They say, uh, you know, this person that is coming to our church, everything that the pastor said he's doing, he is also duplicating everything by evil power. And they are rushing to that place, rushing to that place, hardening their heart that the truth of the gospel will not penetrate. Human agents, demonic agents. Number three, spirit of divination. Hindering the people to seek or accept the true manifestation of God's spirit. Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Verses 16 to 18. That woman, that lady with the spirit of nation said, These are the servants of the Most High God who are showing unto us the way of salvation. You know what? That was of the devil. What she said was right, but it was coming from the evil spirit. What if Paul had not said anything or done anything and had left that city after multitudes have listened to Paul, the woman would have done the follow-up. Because the woman would have said, the power they have, you know, the power I'm using is the same power they are using. And you know, when they were here, I was a publicity agent. And the spirit in me made me to point them out to you. These are the men of God. And you know, they accepted me. And I walked along with them. And therefore, I also now, now that they have gone, I will continue the follow-up. And nobody will remain with the Lord. That's the tactics or the, or the uh, method of the devil. Sometimes it's Jezebel's strong influence in the church. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 22. Connected with Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. And that Jezebel will be so strong, seducing people, leading people astray. And uh, the pastor might say, I cannot deal with that woman because she has such a strong influence. And if I deal with that woman, that woman may pull a lot of people away. If you don't deal with that woman, instead of pulling all the people away, the whole church will be ruined. Number three, temptations. I've talked of evil spirits used by the devil. I've talked of human agents used by the devil. Now temptation. The devil also uses temptation. Temptation is a suggestion from the devil, an enticement from the enemy of our soul to do something wrong or something sinful. And as ministers, there are three major areas of temptation. Of course, we know that temptations could multiply into many, many folds. But there are three major areas. One area, the women. For a minister, we must remember Samson. He had such a great power. But the Philistines who couldn't defeat him in any other way, they defeated him through Delilah. Remember Solomon? That man had wisdom. But even him did outlandish women cause to sin. The story of uh, the, that part of uh, the life of Samson you want to look at later is Judges chapter 16. Verses 15 to 17. We'll read everything up to verse 20 later. And in case of Solomon, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26. Two. Another thing that the devil uses as a strong uh, bait in temptation is money with materialism. Remember Judas Iscariot? Remember Achan. Another thing that the devil uses is pride. Remember Hosea? In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 14 to 16, when he was held by the Lord, his heart was lifted up. Women, money, pride. For you to remember, a particular minister has put it this way, that the major temptations of ministers of the gospel 
could be put like this, females, fawns, and fame. Just to help you to remember, females, fawns, and fame. Female means women. Fonts, F-U-N-D-S, of finances. Fonts of finances. And fame, pride. You see, sometimes, instead of just facing the ministry, doing what the Lord wants us to do, we might be satraged, looking for fame, pride of life. And we'll be satraged, we'll be defeated by the tempter. Another person put it like this, and he said, the devil tries to get men of God, ministers, through girls, gold, and glory. Girls, you know sometimes after you've been married for some time, five years, ten years, if you are not careful, your wife looks to you like an old woman. And all these girls that you see around, the devil might be tempting you. Are these girls not better than your wife? No, they are not better. They are worse. They are terrible. If they get near you, they will be instruments of the devil. Girls, gold. That's money. Silver and gold. Glory. Seeking glory of through the ministry. We want to be known. We want to have this, we want to have that. If we're known, that is good, but let it come on its own. Not that we leave the ministry aside looking for glory that comes with men. Another person still puts it like this. Women, wealth, and worship. That if we're not careful, that the temptation from the devil will be that we are sidetracked by women or by wealth or by seeking worship. We like people to worship us now instead of worshiping God. And it's still that pride. And it's to emphasize all these ministers who have used all these words, starting the same way or the same letter of the alphabet, is just to make us remember female fonts of fame, Girls, gold or glory, women, wealth or worship. They all mean women or money and pride. And the temptation towards women is something that we should watch against seriously, very seriously. Because um, if you are reading the news coming from a lot of sources, a lot of places. The people of the world, whenever they hear that a minister has fallen through women, they like to blow it up. And last year, we heard of the scandal of a particular minister in America with women. It was blown up and blown up and blown up. And this year again, we've had another scandal. Right now, a crusade should have been going on in Lagos. But the person that should have been conducting that crusade, he couldn't because of the scandal that has been blown up. Ministry, great, great, great ministry destroyed like that because of a brief moment with a woman. Don't let the devil use anything in your life. We're fighting a battle. Whatever has happened in the past, put everything under the blood of Jesus and say from now on, the devil will not be able to cheat me anymore. I will be triumphant in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we overcome? How do we, how do we become triumphant in spiritual warfare? That's point number three. And I'll give it to you in quick succession because of our time. Number one, pray. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 13, deliver us from evil from temptation number two watch make no provision for the flesh matthew chapter 26 and verse 41 watch and pray number three resist we read that already or we read a part of it in first peter chapter 5 verses 8 and 9 resist the devil whom resist 
steadfastly in the faith. You resist the devil, you resist his messengers, you resist his offers. He may offer anything to you to please the flesh, resist it. He may offer anything to you. Another job, instead of preaching the gospel, resist that offer. He may offer anything here or here or in another country. Resist it and remember that the devil, all he wants to do whenever he offers anything to anyone of us is to destroy, is to seduce, and is to kill everything that is important in our lives. Number four, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 17. Number five, be completely committed to God's word and God's will. Be like Jesus Christ who said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Be committed to the word of the Lord and to the will of the Lord. I believe that we'll be victorious. We'll be triumphant. Whatever the devil is planning, God has shown us his methods, his weapons, his strategy. And he has shown us all these things so that we will overcome. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always, always, whatever the time, whatever the situation, always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. My prayer for us is that the devil will never be able to destroy our ministry. He'll never be able to defeat us. And whatever his temptation, whatever his method, we shall overcome in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord. Show us all these things so that the devil will not take us in ignorance. But we shall overcome. There's any way you know you have been defeated in the past? Talk to the Lord about it. Fellow ministers of the gospel, this is the cross of the matter. If you are able to overcome in this area, it is sure we will make it. And so you need to ask the Savior to help you this morning. Wherever you discover you are falling, don't remain down. You can rise. You can rise. Ask the Lord to help you. We have known the enemy. We have seen the weapon. We have seen the temptation. We have seen the triumph. Ask the Lord to help you. Oh Lord, help me. Help me, oh God. Wherever you are falling, wherever you notice the canker one has eaten deep, ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Savior to help you. Our Lord, we come before you this morning to appreciate all that you are unfolding to us under this meeting. And particularly this morning, when you have laid the word of God openly before our eyes to show us who our enemy is, to show us the various purposes, why he tempts, why he wants to hack us down, to sift us and to reduce us to nothing, to corrupt the mind. And to make us to, to go away from the calling and from the ministry. And we know the great weapons he uses. Women, money, and pride. We know all these things and we'll never forget their Lord. But I'm praying that as we live here, oh Lord, that every one of us will wash unto prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 